Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creative Confidence Podcast. I'm Suzanne Gibbs Howard, founder of IDOU. I'm very excited to see everyone today. Uh, we always have special guests on our podcast. Today is no different. We talk about topics from creativity to leadership to innovation to growth. And we always make room for all of you in our podcast as well. So I invite you to introduce yourself if you haven't already. Let us know where you are today. I've already seen people from Nashville to Mumbai, Valencia to Toronto, and Hamburg to Santiago. And I just saw somebody from Luxembourg. So thank you for joining us from all over the world, wherever you are. We're so happy you're here. And please feel free to ask your questions in the, in the chat too, because in the last minutes of our podcast, we like to get to your questions so you can get insights into something that you're working on as well. Um, so today, my special guest is a returnee. Uh, it is Sasha Connor. She is the CEO of Virtual Work Insider, which is a consultancy that provides not only thought leadership, but also training on how to lead, communicate, collaborate, and build culture in hybrid and remote teams. This is still on the forefront of our minds today. Sasha is an expert in this space. She has 18 years of business leadership and marketing, sales, new product innovation at Fortune 500 companies and also in agencies. 12 of those years were leading hybrid and remote teams. And she was the first director um, in her company, the Clorox company, where she still led brands of over um, $250 million. She was the first fully remote member of the leadership team of a $1 billion division. So she is living proof that it is po possible to have incredible amounts of impact and influence while working remote. I met her in March of 2020. She shared her insights about how to work positively in uh, remote and hybrid ways, right when everybody was shifting overnight to remote teams during the height of COVID. Um, we checked in with her again to think about patterns that we were seeing and how hybrid and more organizations were emerging. And today, as this is really normalized in our workforce, we wanna think about increasing your impact and learning how to have real powerful influence, even as a hybrid or a remote worker, and especially as a re remote leader. So to give me and Sasha some sense of where you are working situation-wise, we wanted to start off with a really quick poll. So we've got that popped up. So I'm going to ask each of you to respond to this poll about what is your current work situation? Are you fully remote? Are you hybrid flexible? Like there are some general guidelines about how you're supposed to work, but it's not a clear structure. Are you hybrid structured? Like specific days of the week that everybody's in? Is everybody in the office, are you in the office every day or is it something else? So go ahead, I'll give you just a couple more seconds to vote there. And then we'll close out that poll and see what we've got. All right. Wow. So definitely fully remote is dominant. Sasha, what do you see? In, in yeah. I'm so, so hello, everybody. Thanks for having me back. I'm so glad to be back here with Suze and all of you. So yes, it, it's looking like we've got 55% of you are working fully remotely now. It may mean that you're actually working with some other people who might be in an office here or there. But um, it's this is actually different than what I normally see. I normally see a lot um, that have a hybrid work situation where people are coming in and out of the offices too. So great to know kind of how the, how you as the audience are breaking out. I, we probably over-indexed on the fully remote people <laughs> with this topic, but I think that's great. Um, but I want to start with something that's very current. I think today in the news, the last few weeks and months, we've seen more and more companies pushing for people to come back in person, whether that's in-person full-time or specific days of the week, companies like Meta or Facebook, Amazon, JP Morgan, Bloomberg. There have been articles about them talking about pushing people to come back into the office again. At the same time, we know hybrid has been normalized. Most offices have at least some people remote, if not large numbers of people remote part-time. So Sasha, what do you think about these companies requiring people to come back in and be in person in the office? 
Yeah. So every company is de defining their workforce and workplace strategy a little differently. As you can see, even with the poll that we gave you, there's so many ways to define this. And these are really complex decisions that these decision makers at these organizations are having to take into account the industry that the company is in, the type of work they do, what the employees want, their real estate investments, and all these other factors. And so when I get the question around, you know, how can I entice people back into the office more? I actually believe that's the wrong question to ask. You know, oftentimes the choice to increase those in-office days is based on this faulty premise that innovation and collaboration and mentorship and personal connection can only be done when we're in person. But the reality of the situation is that even when people come into an office a few days a week, they're still working with people in other locations. So the better question that we should be asking is, how can we better equip our employees to work together regardless of where people are located from on any given day? And to, to help support our employees in that, we need to know that there's this emerging expectation of employees. It's what I call becoming an, an omnimodal leader, which, which means that you need to learn how to become equally successful at communicating, collaborating, building relationships, influencing, which we're going to talk about today, within a fully remote group, within a fully in-person group, and in a hybrid environment where you might be with the location majority in a conference room, for example, with other people who are remote, or you might be remote with other people who are co-located. Yeah. And so helpful. Yeah. Keep yeah. going. Sorry. And, and just to finish that out, you know, to, you're going to need to be able to switch between those modes on any given day. And so this is a huge ask to learn how to do that. So it's going to take some practice and some, some upskilling and some time to be comfortable with all of those modes. Yeah. So omnimodal versus just everybody back in the office and feeling like that's the only way to actually have influence and make progress. I think that's super important. And so when we think about, um, I know most of the time today, we'll spend time thinking about how you as an individual can, can strategically influence, but thinking about the people who are here as leaders or speaking at the organizational level, um, we know that power does shift when we're not in a state that people get this point about omnimodal leadership and power can shift if people are not all physically in there, if some people are remote. How do you think teams and leaders can be more inclusive? What do they need to pay attention to? I always like to start thinking about those um, unconscious biases that happen, especially when we're in these hybrid and remote work environments. So the first one is distance bias, which is also known as proximity bias, which is our brain's natural tendency to put more value on the things that are closer to us than those that are farther away. So this is part of the Neuro Leadership Institute's unconscious bias model. And then there's its close cousin, which is recency bias, which is our brain's natural tendency to put more value on the people that you've heard from or seen more recently. So we wanted to do a quick exercise in the chat with you all to illustrate these biases. So I want you to think about this scenario. You need to ask someone for help on your most important project. Who do you ask? Who comes to mind? Don't overthink it. Now, was the first person you thought of one of the last people that you've seen or heard from? So in the chat, we want you to write yes or no. Was the first person that you thought of one of the last people that you've heard from or seen? All right. I'm seeing, seeing the I'm chat going off right now. <laughs> Lots of responses. I think Lots it's, of responses. it's tipped toward yes, for sure. Yes. And that's what we, I normally see when I, when I give this prompt, right? So that's, you know, th that's one of these biases that recency bias at play. So just a quick tip here to mitigate this bias. So think about posting a photo of your entire team near your computer. That way you'll have a visual trigger or a reminder mm -hmm. of your entire ecosystem, not just the last person that you heard from or saw. Yeah, that's a great one. I think there's so many times that I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what was that list again of everyone who's involved in this project and trying to remember it? But if you can have something, even if it's just a, a screenshot of everybody in a meeting, I think that would be great. Terrific. Okay. So we've got to be aware of those biases. Um, so now 
when you and I first started talking about these things, we, we started thinking about some tools to help set up for hybrid and remote work, setting team agreements, thinking about how to operate a remote work organization. But today we want to focus in on influence. Um, and, and I feel like this is relevant if you're a full-time employee. I honestly, I think some of the tips you have are relevant for somebody who's full-time in person. Uh, but also if you're a part-time worker and, and as well, if you're a contractor or a consultant, so you're for a time working in an organization, but often remote. But can you start off just telling us how, how you define influence? What does influence mean to you? Why is it important? Yeah, I, I like this definition of influence, which is the ability to motivate and inspire others to take action. And it's a distinguishing factor between a leader and a manager. And the best leaders are those that successfully influence up and down and across and inside and outside of their organization to be able to impact business results. But there's also this other component of exposure. So meaning like who knows about you, who knows what you do, you know, do others inside and outside of your organization know anything about you or what you do? And so there's actually some longstanding research that shows that exposure accounts for 60% of career success. Wow. So, so much higher than performance, which only accounts for 10%. So in order to have influence and create that exposure, when you're working in these hybrid and remote environments, you need to adjust your behaviors to account for distance, right? To help mitigate some of those unconscious biases we just talked about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's so funny. It makes, it makes me think that you're, you're running your career and your person just as you would be running any sort of a product in the world, brand, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Or your brand. personal branding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got your elevator pitch. People need to have an awareness of you. And then that's how you get involved in the right things and get to do the work that you're most passionate about and that will have impact in the world. That's great. Um, so now if we set up a, a personal strategy to have more influence in a hybrid or remote environment, how do you think that through? Yeah, so I, I designed a training program to help people create their virtual influence and exposure plan. I think this is one of the most important skills to learn and actually one of the hardest to master. And I developed the program based on my experience from when I went remote back in 2010 as a senior business and marketing leader at the Clorox company. I was located in my home office here in the Philadelphia suburbs and my team, my key stakeholders, they were all mostly co-located together in that headquarters in Oakland, California. That was 3000 miles, three time zones away from me. And right. I realized that in order to be successful with both hitting my, my business goals and also my career aspirations, I needed to make it them feel as if I was in that building every day. <laughs> I needed them to feel my, my virtual presence. I needed to lead their thinking and have influence even when I couldn't bump into them at the water cooler, in the elevator, in the parking lot. So the, the program includes a five-step exercise. And today we wanted to, to touch on those five steps so that we could give you all some really tangible things to try out. So we're going to go through the five steps and then give you a couple scenarios. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. So step number one is the who. This is like the most important step to start here. First, you need to map out your sphere of influence. So on a piece of paper, take five minutes you know, to sketch out all of those different people that you need to influence or gain exposure to up, down, across, inside, outside your organization. And usually what I hear after people do this exercise is, Wow, that is a big, hairy map. You know, I knew I had a lot of stakeholders, but I, I didn't realize how many I actually had until I mapped it out. And then usually when I review these maps, when, when some of our learners do it, I see that people do a pretty good job of, of mapping out their internal stakeholders, but actually might have missed a bunch of external stakeholders or they might even see a pattern where they, they need to influence someone that they don't have direct access to. Yeah. So they need to consider how to influence indirectly through others to that key stakeholder. I mean, that's, so this is an exercise that I've done in the other workshops that I've taught about innovation and creative leadership. And I've seen this in articles as well. In fact, I was just reading an article from Haas Business School the other day that was talking about this, that when you're talking about creativity and innovation, those informal connections 
are even more pertinent, right? If you want to have creative ideas, you need to get out of your own box and the way the habits you have. So you've got to bump into people without the proverbial water cooler conversation or some sort of gathering where you have those hallway touch points. It's hard to influence. Same thing with innovation. Um, You need the organization to do new things, work in new ways. For career navigation, you need those informal touch points. So I think really calling out the people who have informal power and who you want to informally influence is is something I commonly see missed. So that's who... What's after that? Right. And so now that you've got this big hairy map, you need to prioritize. So I say just start with picking two stakeholders that you need to build an influence plan for. You know, after you build the muscle, you can go back to your map and actually pick some other people to build a map for. So the next step is the why. You need to get really clear on why do you need to influence that person or build exposure with that person. And and getting clear on that will help you create a really targeted plan. So Sue's actually just even mentioned a couple of those reasons as to why. So they could be things like influencing thinking on the business to hit your sales goals, to launch a new product or establishing a personal connection to to build trust, uh, to raise awareness of your work or your team's work, which could be in service of actually helping you to enable your career advancement. So that second step is the why. So the the third step is the how. So how do your stakeholders like to be communicated with? Are they formal communicators? Do they want formal emails? Are they looking for in-person meetings where you send a pre-read ahead of time? Or are they more informal? They like text messages or direct messages or quick phone call. And do you even know the answer to that question? Or do you have to seek out that information? Oftentimes I hear like, wow, I don't even know how that person likes to be communicated with. And that in and of itself is a great insight and and a prompt for you to go seek out that information. Yeah. What channel are they on? What do what do, do they like short things, long things, phone calls, texts, other mediums? That's so important. Great. Okay. So we've got who, why, how, and then what? Then is the when. So number number step is number four is, is when you will need to determine the best aperture with which to gain that exposure or that influence. And so what do I mean by aperture? I mean, determining the best window of time for when your stakeholder is going to be receptive to your message. And I want you to get really specific here. So thinking about day of week, time of day, a specific window of time in advance of a key milestone. So so for example, my Clorox marketing VP that I reported into was based in the Oakland, California head headquarters office. So me in Philadelphia, I I didn't have the opportunity to just swing by his office. So we jointly decided upon the best time for me to influence him was at 7.30 a.m. Pacific, which was 10.30 a.m. for me when he was in his car driving to the office. That's when I had his undivided attention. That's so great. And I feel like people actually like to be asked How they, you know, do you need something? What works best for you? How far in advance do you need things? Are you better if we just meet for 30 minutes? So don't be shy about asking would be one of the things I'd build on there. That's awesome. Okay. Anything else? Well, step five. So step five is the what. This is the last step. This is when you need to pick what tactics you're going to use to influence and gain exposure to each of those stakeholders that you picked. And what tactics you choose is going to depend on what you decided for as your why and what you discovered about the how, the how your stakeholders like to be communicated with. Okay, that's awesome. So we've got who, why, how, when, and what. Um, and I know with the, what it's, it helps to have illustrations. And so I know we picked a couple of scenarios to maybe walk through a specific, a more specific situation just to give people lots of ideas. And at the same time, I want to tell people after we do these scenarios, we'll go into answering some of your questions. So feel free to pop questions into the chat and we will tackle as many of those as we have time for, um, So the first scenario that I thought we'd lean into is one that I think for most of us, it's completely annoying when you can't get it done. It's making a decision. It's horrible if you're the leader and you can't coalesce the right information and you're in one of those meetings where everybody's looking at each other 
you're trying to figure out what to decide. And if it's your work, you want people to decide so that you can move on to next steps. So what are, how would you walk through your strategy? If, if I was coming to you and saying, I need this decision made, what should I do? Great. So let's, let's take that as a scenario and we'll walk through the five steps there. So Susan's given us the why it's about making decisions. So you need to influence in order to get your recommendation or your proposal approved. So if we think about the who then, so you want to think about who's the formal decision maker and perhaps also determining those informal decision makers that Suze was referring to earlier. Those are people that actually are also going to be influencing the decision maker on your behalf. So perhaps you want to do even like a mini map of your sphere of influence just for this particular decision that needs to be made. And then from there, it would go into the when. When is the right aperture for the influence? So perhaps it's five days before the decision meeting. You know, at Clorox, we used to have these, these um, every other week, a leadership team meeting where pre-reads were sent out ahead of time, or you know, we needed to do some of this informal influence before the actual meeting. Since that was the best window to actually start priming people to, to be open to your recommendation. And then your how. So Perhaps you know that 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 decision maker is booked in back to back meetings like so many of us. So the best way to prime them is through maybe asynchronous communication, meaning like do not set up another pre meeting ahead of the decision making meeting. And then if you think about the what. What you could do is try something that I call video mail. So the next time you're about to send an email with a recommendation or proposal or creative idea, instead maybe create a video mail because we know that video can make a, a message really memorable and sticky and you can provide so much more context than just the written word. So it's as simple as just recording yourself in a, in a solo Zoom meeting, a Microsoft Teams meeting, doing some screen sharing so you can bring some visuals to bring your idea to life. And then send that for your decision maker to, to watch that ahead of time before the decision. So I've used this really successfully with even clients of mine where I needed to share a point of view or influence their thinking. And we just could not find time to actually live sync up. Yeah, that's great. I love it when people do the video meal or uh, we think of it in this world of digital learning and online learning. It's called flipping the classroom, right? Why don't you send the lecture part beforehand in a really concise format so that when you get together, you can make the most of all of that discussion time. That's great. Um, okay. So that is super helpful. Uh, another common scenario we wanted to talk about when you are a remote or a virtual person, part-time or full-time is, is navigating your career. I think there have been lots of things talking about imbalances of power, especially opportunities being offered to more people who are physically in the workplace, that, that um, proximity bias. How do you have influence remotely when it comes to the point where you might want to shift your career, or shift your current role and get into doing new things? Yeah, this is important to talk about navigating your career in these hybrid and remote situations. So you know, you, that links again to the why, right? There might be other people in other parts of the company or even externally that you want to get to know, to learn from them, to get mentored by them, um, to potentially even work for them. And if you think about the who here, so back to like, who are our stakeholders, this can be really tricky because when you do that sphere of influence map, you can only map out your known networks, the people that you know are in that extended network. And this is where you're gonna need some help to build out your unknown networks. So this is where you can use your manager, you can use other senior leaders, you can use your peers to find out who you need to get introduced to, who you need to gain exposure to based on your career aspirations. So as we think about the what in that situation, the tactics that you could choose for your what could include things like, you know, an initial coffee chat, right? Just start to build that relationship. That can be done virtually if you're at a distance from whoever that stakeholder is. Or you can even find out if you have a hybrid overlap day in the office, uh, because that's a great time to, um, to connect when you're in person if you have that opportunity, right? It's a great use of in-person in-office time. And 
when you are doing that, that connect with that new person who's been identified as somebody who you think you could learn from or who you might want to work for in, in the future, make sure you do your research on that person and determine what value you can actually bring to that interaction so that it's mutually beneficial to both of you. So for example, you might want to provide a perspective on something that you know that they're interested in or something that they're working on. Um, I had had an example of a learner in one of our programs who identified a manager in a different function that she had interest in working for. And she followed this five-step process and she ended up being offered a, a role in the other manager's group. And this was because she was continuously bringing valuable insights to that other manager about the work that the manager was doing that went much beyond just having, you know, a virtual coffee chat with them. Yeah. That's so nice. I mean, it, it's interesting because I feel like you're bringing the skills of networking inside of your organization and sort of saying the responsibilities on the person to, to create those networks if you want to have this kind of influence. And so putting that kind of energy out into the world, making those connections, finding the excuses to talk to people. I think that's really pertinent information. Um. A third scenario we wanted to think about is, um, we know we have a lot of people on this call and in our community here at IDOU who are working as consultants or they're working in freelance capacities or um, maybe they're taking on projects inside of companies. When you're new in that sort of a capacity, what are some of your recommendations for how to, how to set up for influence probably quite quickly and strategically? If you are an external consultant or an agency working with a client on a new project, you are behind these like extra thick virtual curtains <laughs> because you're on the outside of that organization. So to determine your who, you should first take a stab at that influence map again. So mapping out you know, who you think on the client side you need to influence or gain exposure to. And then you're going to ask need to ask for some help. Maybe ask your client to help fill in some of those gaps. Um, when I've been building out even my own maps for clients that we're working with, I ask for org charts uh, to take a look at, at how things are structured. Also, I observe meetings and get copied on some of their digital communication because that allows me to see you know, who's invited to certain meetings, observe the meeting interactions, see who's copied on some of those asynchronous communications to give me a sense of, again, those formal and informal decision makers. And when you are working externally as, again, a consultant, an agency, something like that, you know, why do you need to have that influence? Well, you are going to need to especially hack that distance bias and recency bias that we talked about earlier. So I'll give you an example. When I was a marketing director at Clorox, I was working with seven external marketing agencies at any given time. And what I found was those agencies that not only stayed top of mind with me, but also continuously brought me value by inspiring me with ideas were actually the ones that I was giving more scope to over time. So this is really important in terms of meeting your business goals as a, as a consultant or in client services. So at, when we get to the, the last step of the what, you know, consider how you're going to continue to add value, right? It could be through offering a point of view on, um, on the work that's being done through a video mail, like we just talked about, or another idea is just really leverage your social media. So I would imagine that many of you are linked in with your clients or your customers, and that is a great way to indirectly influence them by continuously putting out thought leadership content that they will organically see in their feeds. Wow. That's great. Um, and I think it's, well, I've seen this also, it doesn't have to be your own unique thought leadership, but other things that you're reading. If I know that's kind of overwhelming to people to think you've got to produce all of your own content, but I think there are other ways to get there too. Super, super interesting. Um, and I think I'm seeing from some, some of the questions in our chat that people are wondering, what if you're not an external person, but you're internal and you're still new? Are there things that shift there with how you would strategize about influence? Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. are new to a company or if you're new to a team, even within a company that you have been with for a while, 
these are great steps to put together, to put your, your virtual influence plan together. So I would say that that aperture of being new, new to company, new to team is a great aperture to do that mapping of the, that sphere of influence. And I would say to work with your manager also on that map, because again, you will only know so much. They're going to have to help you fill in those gaps of who are the people that you actually need to build relationships with to get the work done, um, since that's not going to be completely evident to you within your new team. Yeah, I know when I was um, bringing new people on board in various organizations, I always give them a, a coffee chat list, like who should they be inviting out so that they can meet people. And then as a consultant with IDEO, we always have a looking in phase where it's all of that. It's just going around meeting with different people at the organization, often one-on-one -on -one or smaller groups so that you truly get to know their unique perspective and things they might not say in a big room. And all of that information is extraordinarily valuable. All right, we're going to get to Q&A in just a second. Please feel free. We're getting some great questions in. But Sasha, I know you're always incredibly generous with resources for our community. You've already been so helpful, but you have something that that's a free resource that's printed. Can you tell us where to find it? Sure. So yes, I created a learning aid that recaps everything that we're talking about today, including these five steps to creating your personal virtual influence and exposure plan. So you can download it at our website, which is virtualworkinsider.com and then forward slash IDEO influence. So I know we're popping that in a chat too, so you can go there nice. directly. Great. So for questions, um, we have a couple questions more on omnimodal leadership. Can you talk about it once again? What is it? And then um, can you talk about the skills you can practice to be an omnimodal leader? Sure. So just to recap on omnimodal. So the modes that we're talking about is having to switch seamlessly between working with a fully in-person group a fully remote group, and then a hybrid group in between. And let, I'll give you an example, a real world example of how this is coming to life for some people in the workforce right now, which is in the morning, they might be at home and they might jump on a global Zoom call where everyone's remote and they have to lead that fully remote call. Then they hop into a, a car and commute to work. And once they get to work, they are working in small in-person teams that are in the office with them. And then they actually, while they're at the office, jump into a conference room where they are with a group of people co-located in a conference room talking to people who are remote in other locations. Then they hop back in their car, get home, and have to jump on a call where they themselves are fully remote, and there's a group of people who are co-located together in a conference room. Right? All these different modes where you have to figure out how to fa facilitate, communicate, connect, and it's it's really difficult to be um, equally successful at all of them. And so, where I would the back to your question around, you know, what do we need to work on to to actually um, be successful um, in in this omnimodal world? Um, so, one of those skills we're talking about in depth today, which is the influence. I would also think about your communication skills. So, thinking about how can you um, get a good balance of synchronous and asynchronous communication? So thinking about asynchronous communication, knowing what the right communication tools are to be able to communicate in the right around the right topic. So is that email for certain topics? Is that Microsoft Teams or Slack for other topics? And then also knowing how to actually be um, able to facilitate really effective and inclusive virtual, hybrid, and remote meetings. And so th that is a really hard skill to manage, to learn. So starting with um, getting really clear on agenda items for a meeting so you're prepared as a, as a facilitator to know what is that outcome that you're looking for, for from the group, and then thinking about the process by which you're going to facilitate based on the geographic anatomy of that team. So there's a whole nother training that we get into on how to how to lead effective um, virtual and, and hybrid meetings, um, but it, it is a, um, a really important skill. Awesome. I know with effective inclusive meetings, one tiny tip that I love that someone brought to me on my team was um, if you want everyone to speak, having people answer something small right up front 
just gets their voice into the room or doing things like giving them time to think and then respond or ways to include people who might be a little more introverted and or need a little more time in their thinking. So I love all of these things you're talking about. Okay. So we've got a lot of questions now. Um, great question from Luke. Um, they are asking about, you mentioned 60% of career success is related to exposure even more than performance. And I, when you said that stat, I was <laughs> a little bit concerned too. And I want to talk about the why behind Luke's question. So Luke is asking how, or how can we help leaders shift that paradigm to tilt things more in favor of actual performance? The concern behind this is for employees living with mental health challenges who are neurodivergent. I was talking about people who might be a little more introverted. They, they have battles in seeking and creating exposure. So how do you help tilt things in terms of actual performance? Or do you have tips for people who might not be as extroverted or natural networkers? So lots in there. Yeah, I, I think those are all really great questions here. Um, and I think like as we get back to that influence plan that we were talking about today, so perhaps, you know, you might create your influence plan and say like, I really feel uncomfortable with having to reach out to these people to, um, to, to, to meet somebody new that I've never been introduced to before, for example, or, um, I really feel uncomfortable asking, um, a, a new stakeholder how they like to be communicated with. Like, I, I actually hear this a lot, which is like, Yes, I'll create my plan, but then fear holds me back from from um, taking that next step, or it could, or anxiety, or you know, there there's just there's a barrier there, and so that's where I would suggest actually leaning in with your manager to talk about you know that that what you've identified in terms of your needs for um, building your exposure and your influence, and asking them for some help to make this feel like a more comfortable environment for you. So, for example, it could mean somebody actually doing that warm introduction for you uh, so that you aren't reaching out cold. Um, this could be, you know, if you want to try video mail, which I know a lot of people are really um, not comfortable with recording themselves. Uh, um, this could be just experimenting this with on this with one of your friends at work where you, you know, in a really low risk environment, try this out, send it to them and get feedback. So taking some baby steps there and then also um, help having your manager help you with some of those warm intros can help. Yeah. All great. Uh, Nicole's saying it's all about vulnerability. Yes, it is. And any um, thinking about Luke's question on tilting things more in favor of performance. I know things that come up for me are a pattern I commonly see is that people just expect their performance to be seen. And a lot of managers are busy and leading multiple people. And so how do you get your performance in front of managers? I think some of the tips I'm often giving people is it's the responsibility is unfortunately on your shoulders to document what you've done and, and present it in a concise fashion. Do you see other things there that you've learned over the years? Right. I think what you're getting to is that visibility, right? And especially hard to stay visible while you're virtual, right? While we're behind these virtual curtains, because it's not like you can walk around an office building and see what people are working on out on their on their on their laptops or, in, or their um, desktops. So one of the ways to think about this is um, I, I, a tip that I did myself actually was uh, when I was leading a large team every Friday. I sent out a wins of the week email and the wins of the week email went to my entire cross-functional team, but also to the leadership team. And it went really far in giving visibility to the work that was being done. So not just what I was doing, but what my team had done and how it was moving the needle. So it is an investment in the people manager's time to actually, so for me to do that every Friday, it took a fair amount of time investment. But it was so helpful. It was so helpful to raise the vis visibility of the performance of the team and also keep those key stakeholders aware of the impact that the group was having on the business results too. Nice. I love that. Weekly wins. That's awesome. Um, another question from Courtney about navigating different management levels. How do you make connections beyond your direct manager 
while still keeping them in the loop, not making anyone feel threatened. Um, and adding into that some complexity, Lauren's asking, what about when you're, you've been told by the VP not to communicate with each other? That's a crazy one, but a really good one. So maybe Courtney first on navigating different management levels. I think, I think finding ways to, um, again, bring, bring value to each other. Um, so if you are, if you want to get access to somebody at a more senior level that you're not working with on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of figuring out what it is that they are interested in, what can help them with, with, um, their agenda and going to them with, um, with some thought leadership there. So for example, um, when I was at Clorox and I first went remote and I realized that this was one of the most important things for me was to, to raise my exposure from 3000 miles away. I had a, an idea of how to, um, create an employee resource group that actually would help all of the people who are not co-located at the, at headquarters, we called it orbit. And it was the first ever virtual workforce employee resource group. And it helped me to have a platform to talk to the executive committee of the company, to talk to those senior leaders about a topic around how do we move the company into that future of work? And as I mentioned, ERGs, this employee resource groups, that's another way to actually get connected in to senior leaders and other parts of the company. So to join an employee resource group, and then usually they have lots of events, virtual and in person, where you can actually network with people at different levels of the company. That's fantastic. Um, great. We'll do one more question from Zane. Um, Zane is asking uh, if you've got ambiguity on a project, something that you're dealing with and, and you're virtual, but you can't kind of get anybody to take ownership of something. How would you navigate that? Any tips? It's really important to think about the, uh, the roles and responsibilities on any given project. So we do a lot of work working with teams on creating team working agreements or team charters where we get really intentional about spelling out all sorts of things when it comes to communication norms, but also roles and responsibilities. So who is responsible for what, including who is the decision maker, who's a recommender, who, who needs to be informed on different topics. And so slowing down so to, slow, to go slow, to go fast is really important to kind of set that up. And it's something we even, when we're working with clients, we create team working agreements between my team at Virtual Work Insider and the client to have those things set up in advance before we actually kick off the project. And I've, I've, I've definitely seen having a proper kickoff is key, but if you're even uh, mid-flight, it's you can just call a check-in yes, and say, hey, we're enough. struggling with a bit of lack of clarity. Let's Let's get straight on these questions because the actuality is that things shift and everything's constantly changing. Um, I always get the last question. So I'm going to ask this to Sasha and give her a moment to think and share a couple other resources for people. Um, but my question for you, Sasha, is um, what do you think is next for the future of work? And uh, while you think about that, I just want to thank everyone for your participation today. It's always great to hear, have you here on the Creative Confidence Podcast. We have Sasha Connor, CEO of Virtual Work Insider. Um, she thinks a lot and helps companies with hybrid and remote teams. You can find her on virtual work in, virtualworkinsider.com. Um, Sasha, what do you think is next for us all to be thinking about? It was actually a really good timing for that question because I just got back from speaking at the running remote conference in Lisbon, Portugal, and I spent time there with those on the cutting edge of the future of work at, from companies around the world. And one of the key takeaways is that the future of work is not just about location flexibility. It's also that employees want time flexibility even more. So there's actually some great research from the Future Forum that's been tracking this for the past couple of years, and it consistently shows that 81% of people want flexibility in where they work, and 93% of people want flexibility when they work. So providing employees with flexibility where and when they work is really important for employee engagement, for retention, but with that comes a lot of complexity. 
complexity with respect to team coordination and collaboration. And a, a key solve for this is something that we actually organically already started talking about, which is to lead your team through creating a team working agreement, to start to codify some of these norms. When should people be available to each other? How are we going to communicate with each other? How are we going to lead really effective hybrid and remote meetings? And this is a new skill for teams. So as, as we've been helping teams to create these, we've realized that it's a fair amount of investment of, of time up front, but it's so important to becoming that omnimodal leader that we've been talking about. And once you create it, it actually really helps to unleash productivity and that flexibility that people are asking for. Wow. That's the next wave. So we're getting down when uh, we're getting down where and when is the next thing to tackle how to be transparent and inclusive and still effective and influential on all of those fronts. Thank you so much, Sasha. It's always great to have you here. Um, we have so much great insight from you and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We love having you join us live. If you'd like to join us on our next live event, you can check that out on idou.com slash podcast. Um, and from IDOU, we have our online courses on design thinking, innovation, leadership, collaboration, strategy, and so much more. If you're looking for more resources and more learnings about fostering collaboration, tapping into diverse perspectives on your team, I invite you to check out our course, Cultivating Creative Collaboration. You can find more at idou.com slash collaboration. Thank you so much. And I look forward to having you and Sasha back soon. Bye. <laughs>